Yeah, by the way, she just said Eden Smith talked about a friend of his. So I do want to welcome you all here on this somewhat warm uh, spring day. Uh, you, this room has a little bit of a tendency to hold that heat, but you may be grateful for it as it gets a little colder this evening. Uh, this, as I said, is our celebration of the silver anniversary of our college's partnership with Regents Park College of Oxford University. This enduring partnership has been transformational for our students for over a quarter, for nearly a quarter of a century now, and our college community has been deeply enriched by the opportunities to pursue research and present lectures under the sponsorship of Regents Park College. It's been a deep and long partnership. I am very honored, of course, to extend the college's welcome to Sir Malcolm uh, and Lady Allison Evans and to several special guests at the college who are also here today and I would like to recognize them as well. I do invite them to stand as I recognize them. Uh, first is Mr. Carol Stevens. Uh, where is he? There he is, okay. Uh, uh, Carol is currently a board advisor to the Her Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship at the University of Kentucky. And he is a 1971 graduate of Georgetown College whose association with, Re with Regents Park College is long and deep, and we're grateful for him being here today. Mr. Jim Applegate. He too is a longtime leader in higher education, including as a senior vice president of the Lumina Foundation. He is a 1973 graduate, is that right? Did I get that right? Well, I'm young. You are, <laughs> yes, certainly young. Well, anyway. <laughs> Speaking of young, uh, Mr. Knox Thames, currently senior fellow at the Institute uh, for Global Engagement. He is a 1996 uh, graduate of Georgetown College and is visiting us here today and will be visiting some classes tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Russ McCandless. There he is, uh, whose family, as you know, is synonymous with our partnership with Regents Park College uh, as sponsors of the McCandless Lecture Series, and we're very grateful that he has returned to campus for us today. And we are also, I believe, joined by some members of our Board of Trustees. Uh, Mr. Guthrie Zarin, are you here? I didn't see him. Guthrie? Okay. Uh, Jane Cutter, I know that you're here. Please stand. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bob Mills, I thought I saw, oh there he is, okay, Mr. Bob Mills, I for some reason thought I saw you over there, and I'm glad that you are here as well. And of course I want to welcome all of our faculty, staff, and community friends, and more than anybody else I want to welcome our students, because you, particularly our Oxford and Honors students, are the reason why we're here today. I'm so glad that you're here, that you have this opportunity to hear Sir Malcolm, and I also want you to know who he is before he starts speaking to you. So I'm going to invite our provost, uh, Dr. Jonathan Sin Wise, to come forward and make that introduction. Good afternoon. Let me add my welcome to Georgetown and to this auspicious event. And especially, uh, I believe we have several students visiting who are not yet Georgetown College students, but soon will be um, coming for the Oxford Honors Program. So we are honored that you are here as well. Um, I've only seen two faces so far I knew, but I think there's several more here. So uh, thank you all for visiting with us today as well. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sir Malcolm Evans, the new principal, or what we might call a president, of Regents Park College of Oxford University. Sir Malcolm took up the mantle, as it were, uh, in January of this year, and we are very honored that one of his first visits has been, in fact, to our institution. We are doubly honored today that we get to hear a lecture from Sir Malcolm on a topic that is both important and unfortunately perennial, how to prevent torture. Sir Malcolm's expertise in this area is both deep and broad, as I will just very briefly uh, mention. After reading law and completing a doctorate at Regents Park College, he began his work as an academic at the University of Bristol, where he was named Professor of Public International Law and has also served as Head of School and Dean of Faculty at that institution. Sir Malcolm has been involved in research on the international protection of human rights with particular focus on the freedom of religion for which he was knighted in 2015, which is why I get to keep saying Sir Malcolm, and has also focused, of course, on how to prevent torture, a topic that began as an academic study but became an area of activism, as he was saying last night, as he worked with others uh, to begin the United Nations Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, and then as these things happen, was asked to chair that subcommittee. I believe we'll hear more about that today. In 2015, 
He was appointed a member of the panel of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in England and Wales, and he has also served as a member of the advisory panel on freedom of religion and belief of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Sir Malcolm is accompanied today by his wife, Lady Allison. We are honored to have her with us as well. And I will just say as a personal note, having now had the opportunity to share several conversations with them, that they are both immensely warm individuals and we are highly fortunate to have them visiting us today. And I'm very much looking forward to this lecture. And so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Sir Malcolm Evans. And forgive me, but I have never forgotten gotten to say this before. Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, <laughs> Order of the British Empire. Well, 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 thank you very much indeed. Uh, it really is a, a great pleasure to, to, to be here, and thank you all both for the, for the very warm welcome you've given um, to me um, just before these few moments, before I speak, but also um, to, to my wife and I in welcoming us to, to Georgetown. I was very keen that this should be one of the very first places that I should visit in my role as um, the newly appointed principal, a secret. I have been in the role for, oh, all of less than three months. Um, uh, but I know how important this relationship is to Regent's Park. I know how much it is valued by you. And so it seemed very fitting that this should be one of the first opportunities I should have to travel in my new role to celebrate that relationship and indeed 25 years of such a relationship um, here with you today. So I'm both um, pleased and honored to, to, have that, to, to have that opportunity. And yet, what am I going to do with that opportunity? Am I going to squander it on talking of something, as, as we have heard, uh, as perhaps unpleasant as the topic of torture? There is a reason, and that is because, as we have heard, I have devoted, in some ways or another, possibly the best part of 25 years of my life, both as an academic and also then as something of a practitioner in this field, to wrestle with questions of why it is that torture remains so prevalent uh, in the world today and what it is that can actually be done about it. And one of the things that can be done about it um, is the work of trying to prevent torture from occurring. Working within the human rights field, the one thing that is sometimes forgotten is that we can focus so much on holding those to account for the wrongs that they have committed that one can lose sight of the possibilities of trying to work to try to prevent those abuses from taking place at all. And after all, the human right it is to be that no one should be subject to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment and punishment, and yet so often we approach it on the basis that what matters is how we hold people to account for having done the very thing which is prohibited. And so it was against that background that many years ago a far-sighted visionary came up with the idea, which now seems so simple but at the time was seen so radical, that what one could do was to create an, altern an, an entirely alternative means of trying to address the phenomena of torture. And this would be through, inspired by the work of bodies such as the International Committee of the Red Cross and the humanitarian work that they do um, in times of war, why would it not be possible to establish an international body of experts who would have the power to go into any place in any country of the world in order to see what was taking place and make recommendations in order to try to prevent persons being ill-treated by others when they were in those places of detention. Such a powerful, seemingly simple idea and so difficult to bring about. Indeed, the routes to trying to, cre to c convert this idea into a reality took about 30 years of hard negotiations through the United Nations, and I won't go into the detail, but even then only virtually happened by accident. Uh, but sometimes accidents are happy ones. What did this body, um, what did this international convention, known by the unfortunate name of the OPCAT, the Optional Protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture, the international world loves its acronyms, 
Um, what, in a nutshell, does it enable, is, is it enabled to do? The answer is a lot. In about the 90 countries in the world which have agreed, and you do have to agree, to be bound by this system, the committee, the body which this, this convention establishes, is empowered at any time of its due choosing to visit a country, to turn up at any place of detention within that country, demand immediate access, receive immediate access, and to be able, without fetter, to speak to anyone in that place of detention, to see any piece of documentation, to go anywhere and see anything, in short, to do whatever it likes. This is actually quite remarkable. Think about it for a moment. Countries allowing groups of independent international inspectors, observers, to enter into some of their most secret and closed institutions and have free reign to move, to see, to speak, and to come to their conclusions about what is happening to people within those places. And that was the awesome responsibility that I find myself exercising for 10 years as chair of the body that was established to do so. The quid pro quo, which in human rights terms is rather a difficult one, is that what happened with our work, so much of the work of international human rights protection is focused on the idea of transparency, of holding people to account, <laughs> naming and shaming as a means of inducing change. Yet our committee, unlike all the others in the UN human rights world, was tasked to work differently, very differently. We worked on the basis of confidentiality. How does that work? we would visit places of detention. At the end of that, we would speak to those who were in charge within the country and draw up, uh, in addition, confidential reports setting out what we found, what we thought, and, enter and suggesting what could be done, in our view, to make it less likely that people would be ill-treated or tortured in those places, or what to do when there was clear evidence that they were. But those reports remained confidential, and we would enter into dialogue with them about the implementation of those recommendations and try to bring them about. There was more also besides, unique within the UN system, there was also an obligation that each of those countries would also establish similar mechanisms of a similar nature at the national level, national mechanisms that would also have exactly those same powers and work in the same way. And for very many countries in the world, the idea of establishing an, a domestic national level oversight mechanism with such wide reaching powers was itself truly revolutionary. Indeed, um, many was the, the case that we would enter a country, remind states of what they had been committed to, simply to be told that there was almost utter disbelief within certain sectors of the national government that their ministries of foreign affairs could ever have agreed to such far-reaching things. But such things had been agreed and our job was to try to make them happen. I could spend quite a lot of time today, therefore, going through with you all the things we've done to the extent that it can be shared, much of the work is confidential, and to paint a rosy picture of all the great things that could be achieved. And that would be a very positive and a nice thing to do. But having stepped back from this, of course, when one steps back from anything, <laughs> there comes a moment when you want to reflect on perhaps some of the broader lessons and questions that one has learned. And the one that has been keeping recurring in my mind is why is it, why is it, when we have these many mechanisms to try to eradicate and address torture and ill-treatment around the world, and it is worth saying that the prohibition on torture and ill-treatment is probably the most prescribed practice on the face of the planet through international human rights law, domestic law, almost any and everything you will find. There is not a country, well, possibly with one or two exceptions, but barely a country in the, on the face of the planet which accepts the legitimacy of torturing people. And yet, it is one of the most common practices and experiences of people in detention that this happens to them in some way or another. It is nothing like as uncommon as we tend to make ourselves believe. And that pathways into what is the leap motive of what I really want to be saying in the, the short time that is available to me. For my main reflection, 
on why it is proving so difficult with all the mechanisms that we have in place to do better in terms of preventing torture and saving people from the threat of torture is that we need to be a little bit more honest about what it is that we find when we go about doing our work. And not just my committee, but the Human Rights Committee more generally. And this also plays into why perhaps international protection of human rights more generally is not as effective or as useful as I think it should be and indeed could be. And part of the problem for this, indeed, perhaps the beginning and end of the problem, is that we all tend to see what we expect to see and understand things in the way we expect to understand them. Even when those expectations are, in fact, very, very far indeed from reality. And so, as someone visiting places of detention, it is quite possible to spend a great deal of time and energy visiting a country, speaking to detainees, going into prisons, police stations, security detention facilities, psychiatric hospitals, but not really seeing or understanding what is in front of you at all. Because if things look familiar, you assume they will be what you expect them to be and engage with them in that way, even when they are not. Things are often not what we expect them to be, but somehow we still continue to project our assumptions and our expectations um, um, into the evaluations and the recommendations that we, and I admit it, we used to do it ourselves, but many within the human rights world actually, um, actually make. Now sometimes this simply re renders those evaluations and recommendations, let us say, perplexing for those who receive them and makes you just look a little bit foolish on the grounds that you simply haven't got it. You didn't really understand what you were seeing. This can be embarrassing, but it's not the end of the world to be embarrassed. What is far more serious is when, because of your failure to really understand the nature of the situation you are encountering, because you have become so blinded by your expectations that you work end up working in what might be called a fictional or almost parallel universe to that which you were really in. And then there is a real danger that what you say might not only be inappropriate but may even be harmful, putting people at greater risk of suffering from the very things that you were seeking to prevent them from. And at times, my experience of working with the UN in relation to torture prevention did have dimensions of that nature. And in a way, perhaps this shouldn't have surprised me. Um, uh, an example from work I'd done a very long time ago, I was involved in the drafting of a document known as the Robin Island Guidelines on Torture Prevention in Africa, which set out fundamental standards which should be adhered to within the detention process which closely reflected those that have been drafted in Europe and, and other parts of the, of the world. One of the standards that was on the table provided for that within the pre-trial criminal justice process that all persons <laughs> deprived of their liberty should have the right to be visited and to correspond with and communicate with their family members. Now, we are used to visits from lawyers, doctors, and, and, and etc., but what are family members? And some of our European colleagues involved in the drafting jumped on this, pointing out it would be completely inappropriate to allow visits from friends and family um, in all circumstances. This could so easily risk prejudicing the police investigations into a crime, for example, and is certainly not standard or expected practice. Our African colleagues on the drafting committee pointed out that not ensuring access by family members would ultimately run the risk of those in detention starving, as it was family members who usually provided all the detainees with food and drink. The standard was changed. It's a simple example, but in the work I did with the UN for many years, we had plenty of opportunity on numerous visits in Africa but also elsewhere to recognize the overwhelming importance of ensuring that family members knew that their relatives were arrested, detained, and that they were able to visit them. And this is, was an excellent example of 
where the international community has adopted certain assumptions about the way things run, but when projected onto the practical realities in which those things take place, they do not really work. And in the, in briefly, in the time to me, to me, I just want to reflect on a number of other salutary examples of situations in which insisting on what is generally expected um, from a human rights perspective can turn out to be the wrong thing to do when seeking to improve protections for detainees from torture because we are projecting our views of their world which is sometimes just not a reflection of the real world which is affecting them and the circumstances in which they find themselves. Doubtless what we are projecting or thinking should be the way they are but it simply is not. And I'll give you some examples. One of the most important safeguards when a person is taken into custody is often said that, um, that there is someone, a third party, has been notified of the fact of that detention. No one should be taken into detention incommunicado. People should be informed. It ensures there's transparency around the detention process. Um, and you can track what happens to that person through the criminal justice system. So we would often go round, rightly, making recommendations or checking up that, fa that people had been, no that family members and others had been at least notified of, um, of, of people being taken into detention, even if, of course, they might not normally be able to visit them. We once visited a police station and asked whether the families of the two or three men we found in the police cells had been informed, it was late at night, had been informed of the fact that these men had been detained or anybody else. And we were just met with completely blank stares by the police officers. They were just incomprehensible, it was incomprehensible to them. Why on earth would you need to inform the families that these people were in prison, uh, were in police detention? It just made no sense to them. And we explained about the importance of prevention, making sure that people know, et cetera, et cetera. The uncomprehending stares just remained in place, as if we were talking past each other, as indeed we were. We had made the fundamental mistake of assuming that just because something was a police station and that there were people locked up inside the police station, that this had something to do with the exercise of police powers, because it didn't. What actually happened in this place was that if someone came home one evening drunk or otherwise worked worse for wear, it was quite normal in this small community for the family members to take these people to the police station where they would be locked up overnight or until they were sober and then the family members would come and collect them the following day and take them home. The police had not needed to tell the family at all about what was going on for the blindingly obvious reason that it was the family of these men who had put them in the police cells in the first place. It was the men's family and not the police were responsible for them being in the place of detention. The police were merely passive custodians, not jailers in the slightest. Well, one might think that is, uh, you know, these things happen. Um, it is an important example in its way, but it can be a lot more serious than that. In another similar situation uh, we visited, it was turned out to be entirely common, if entirely wrong, for neighbours, rivals, enemies, and the like, to settle private disputes between themselves by taking the, let us call it, the loser in an argument to the local police station to be locked up for a few days. And if after two or three days no further complaints were made, Enough being enough, the police would then simply let them go and that would be the end of the matter. Nevertheless, in the meanwhile, they were indeed accepted to be in police custody. They were properly recorded as being in police custody and this is the point. If you are recorded as being in police detention, then what should happen is that you should be taken before a magistrate, before a judicial authority to have your detention confirmed within a fixed period, 24, 48 hours, it may vary. From a prevention of ill treatment point of view, it is seen as a fundamental safeguard that those in detention and police detention, that uh, the legitimacy of that is confirmed by an independent judicial authority. Except what would have happened in this instance if that had happened? What would have happened is that they would have been remanded in, 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 in custody. 
and taken to a remand centre, a remand prison, very many miles away, because this is what happened to almost everyone, if not everyone, who appeared before a judicial authority in that country. It was just routine. It is what happened. And had this happened, what had started out as a few days of inappropriate private punishment would suddenly turn into potentially years of inappropriate pretrial detention. Though pretrial would be a misnomer, as there was never any real possibility of there being a trial, as there was no case to answer, there would be no investigation, nothing would happen at all. And as there was no system of effective review on the limits of pretrial detention, this could last indefinitely. Is this fictional? No. We met people who had been in such a position for three, four, five years in remand detention because they had been at the wrong end of an argument where and someone had just locked them up in a police cell overnight and they had the mischance of being taken before a magistrate. In short, the very worst thing that could possibly happen to people we met in that police cell was that they should be taken before a magistrate within 48 hours. Give it a couple more hours, they would be free, as they should have been from the start. But if we had insisted on the implementation of that absolutely critical preventive recommendation, it would have been disastrous. It would have been the very opposite of prevention, the antithesis of prevention. And a final similar example, a very different situation. Um, in one country, I was speaking to a group of about four mid-teenage boys who were in a police station in a relatively busy area of a, of, a, of a city one afternoon. They said they'd been there for a couple of hours, but were all quite relaxed. They said they'd been out that morning when a group of police rounded them up and brought them to the police station in a van on arrival. Interestingly, they were told, phone your parents, which they did calling them on their mobile phones, which, interestingly, they still had with them in their cells when we met them. The clear expectation was the parents would be there very soon. They would pay the, the officers some money to the police, and then they'd all be free to go. And this wasn't speculation. It had happened to them a few weeks before. Um, and they said it wasn't a lot of money. The boys were not listed in the custody register, as all the adults were. Should we have insisted that they were? They should have been if they were in police custody, but if they were, the same thing would have happened again. And all the indications were that the boys were right. It was a money-making scam that was being operated, and if the modest sums requested were paid out quickly, then that would be the end of the matter until, of course, the next time. This was all quite wrong, but if you were going to try to prevent people being ill-treated in detention, what do you do in circumstances like that? The point of all this is quite simple, but it is difficult to do. We tend to assume that police stations operate as police stations. This is not always true. It's a bit of a fiction. And if we apply our assumptions of what you do in relation to human rights questions, prevention and the like, into situations which are not quite as you think, don't be surprised if unfortunate results can be had. And of course, I've spoken so far largely about policing. The same is true when you come to prisons around many countries of the world. Except there, in a sense, the problem is even worse. We make assumptions that, that things which are, are just not justified, but unlike in policing, most of us know that the assumptions we are making are not justified, but we carry on making them anyway. And the biggest of these false assumptions in so many countries of the world simply concerns the fundamental question of who runs a prison, who's in charge. Well, we think we all know the detaining authorities, but in truth, the extent to which prisoners and prison gangs can dominate prison life um, is also very well known, well documented. Look at any website, read any newspaper. This is not a surprise. And it's usually seen as a matter of concern, although not a great deal um, is, or in some instances can be done about it. But there is a variant on this. In some countries, powerful prisoners are in effect not only co-opted 
into the day-to-day -day running of prisons by the prison authorities themselves. The prison authorities can't control or run the prisons, and so it is basically outsourced to the prisoners. To all intents and purposes, such prisoners become the jailers, except at the end of the day, when all else has been dealt with, they then return the keys on themselves. And for the avoidance of doubt, they did have the keys. Um, these cell leaders might determine in large overcrowded cells who would sleep where, um, often of course with fees attached reflecting the desirability of which areas of the floor cell leaders would be expected to organize access to toilet facilities, distribution of food, to determine who was in need of medical attention, deal with any internal disagreements within the cell, and as a reward they would have their own designated areas within large cells perhaps, screened off from others with televisions, fridges, foods, beds, armchairs and the like freely available for them and their henchmen who lived in these mini compounds within cells whilst everyone else lay in squalor on the floor outside, outside the makeshift partitions. A society within a society, a world within a world. It has to be said, some worked terribly to say this, really rather well, and actually meant that there was an order and a control which otherwise would have been completely lacking, completely wrong, completely inappropriate, but. But some cell leaders were very different, violent, brutal, exploitative, and detainees were far more concerned about speaking up in front of their cellmates than in front of the prison staff um, when trying to speak to them, time and time again we would enter into a prison cell and find that only one person would be prepared to speak to us. And they would limit themselves to saying, everything's fine, no problems. And if you look round the cell and saw others giving the merest hint of demurring, there would be a very obvious stare, a kick or a glare to remind everybody else who was the boss and that they'd better keep quiet. And they did. Being alert to the risks of detainees <laughs> suffering at the hands of their fellow detainees was at least as great a practical concern as the risk of them suffering ill treatment from the, the staff um, for having spoken to us. It was not, and it isn't, a comfortable truth that some of the worst physical ill treatment that a detainee may ever receive is at the hands of fellow detainees in situations such as this. However, Although much of this risk of ill-treatment and degrading comes from detainees, do international mechanisms concerning protection against torture and ill-treatment ever comment on this? Usually not. The recommendations are almost always directed at the states, turning a blind eye to the fact that they are often not the source of the problem or indeed may be powerless to address it. They are in no position to do much about it. They ought to be, but they are not. They're not in charge, so why do we do it? Another thing which often perplexed me, or came to perplex me over my time, um, concerned a very difficult and touchy area. We often say, when we are looking at prevention, we must get lawyers into prisons, we must get doctors into prisons, people must have the advantage of the rule of law, etc., etc. The theory of prevention stresses the importance of key fundamental safeguards at this of, 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 of this nature. And yet, what we don't tend to comment on anything like as much or even look at or consider is even when there are access to such services, the quality of those services that are provided, are they really up to scratch? It is often not acknowledged that the so-called professionalism of the professionals who are meant to be exercising authority in these places is often quite woeful. One of the most common refrains from remand prisoners, for example, was that although they were entitled to legal assistance, they often only met their lawyers for the first time before a hearing, and those lawyers were often barely acquainted with the facts of the case if they were acquainted with them at all. We spoke to some detainees who didn't even know that their cases had been heard and rep when they'd been represented by lawyers and decisions met. We spoke with some defence lawyers who were honest enough to say that they were paid so little by the state to represent detainees that they did not usually acquaint themselves with the facts of the case at all, but simply advised them as a legal professional to all plead guilty and that they'd offer some sort of plea and mitigation when it came to sentencing. <laughs> 
We found medical forms certifying that persons who had been taken into custody were generally fit and in good health, despite it being blindingly obvious that their general health was not that way at all, the people concerned having easily visible cuts, bruises, abrasions, broken arms and the like, um, that must have predated the cursory medical or clear that they had received often only a couple of hours earlier. How does this, th th this come about? And I've already mentioned judges who simply rubber stamp whatever the detaining authorities request of them. I remember speaking to one, um, one judge who told me, I have to see the prosecutors every week, so I simply do whatever they ask. If you do not understand or appreciate the, the dysfunctionalities or the natures of the systems into which you are speaking, you are not only running the risk of not doing your job of trying to improve the situation for people who are at risk of torture or ill treatment, but you are wasting the opportunity to do it, to do what you can. In some police stations, then, what takes place is not policing as we know it. In some prisons, the prisons exercise, prisoners exercise at least as much internal authority over the lives of detainees on a day-to-day -day basis as the prison officials. We cannot always rely on the professionals in whom we place so much reliance. Now, the really sad thing is that just about nothing that I have told you is revelatory. And much of it is well known to many who work within this sector, and yet, and yet, since these are truths that can be awkward to acknowledge, things tend to proceed on the basis that it is other than it is. When it comes to the issuing of recommendations, human rights bodies often pretend that things are other than the way they are because this is what we want them to be and what we expect them to be, and orthodoxy demands this of us even if this is little short of a fiction. But there can be even bigger fictions again, and even more problematic. As I've already mentioned, just about everything to do with torture prevention presupposes one thing, adherence to some version of the rule of law. If you advocate for legal safeguards and legal protections for those taken into detention, you are assuming that the systems of detention are governed or informed or influenced by the rule of law. However, even this is not always the case. The SBT, the body of which I was chair, visited plenty of countries where there were real and pressing internal security concerns and difficult situations. We did so. Nevertheless, there were some countries where it was simply not worth visiting at all. There is no point in doing an exercise and issuing a confidential report and making confidential recommendations to a government which is either so dysfunctional or ineffectual in its state apparatus that it is not going to be able to conduct a meaningful dialogue with anything about any, anything, let alone protect anyone from anything that's going on. I suppose I expected that. What I did not expect was that variants of that would be present in far more countries than I ever actually imagined. As an international lawyer, and I am an international lawyer, I tend to assume, because we have to assume, the standard practice, which is the sovereignty of the state. It's the foundation on which the entire concept of international political and leader or legal order today is built and contemporary international law makes little sense without it. And indeed, very little of international human rights law as law makes any sense without it. It is again one of the pillars on which it's all constructed. And yet, reflecting on this in the international arena, states demand their sovereignty is not only protected, but that it's fully respected. And in the modern world, statehood and the trappings of statehood are treated as if, like diamonds, they are forever. Not only that, the sovereign equality of states is similarly reified, the great fiction that all states are endowed with the same potency in the international arena, and every state is entitled to equal levels of respect, deference, and authority. This is, of course, nonsense, but there are rules of the game, and there are reasons for those rules. So as an international lawyer, the knowledge that at the level of the of should we say the sovereign equality of states is little more than, a, than pious rhetoric or perhaps impious rhetoric. It's honored symbolically but flouted practically 
should have made me realize that the same would be true at the national level. But until I started working closely in this era, that really had never really dawned on me. What I found was that the writ of law ran far less extensively in far more states than I ever would have expected. Examples, briefly, at a trivial level. When we ever visited, we would be given what was called a letter of credentials, often signed by the Ministry of Foreign, uh, signed by the, the relevant minister for the um, interior, home office, police, etc., etc., that if we had trouble, was meant to show that we had the authority to do whatever it was we meant to do. And getting these was not difficult. What was difficult was getting anyone at the ground to pay any attention to them in some countries. You know, the idea that you can rock up at a police station, um, knock on the uh, uh, police stations were easy, um, rock up at a prison, knock on the door and go inside and, and have a look around. It does seem a little bit bizarre, but amazingly, we were able to do it in most places most of the time. But one of the things that was least effective if we were having a trouble was pulling out a piece of paper with the authorization of the relevant minister on it. What on earth relevance was that? The only thing that mattered was your immediate boss within the institution thought. And if they were at lunch or couldn't be, couldn't be interested, well, nothing was going to happen. And any piece of paper from any civilian authority wasn't going to change the chain of command on the ground. I encountered some cases where the ministries themselves seemed genuinely surprised to discover how little effect their <laughs> instructions had operationally although I also encountered plenty where I was left with the impression that they would have been amazed if they'd have been of any real effect whatsoever. We also ran into situations where certain local administrations paid absolutely no attention to the instructions from central authorities about anything. They basically ran their own mini fiefdoms. And we even ran into some situations where the national authorities, the government, admitted in a lovely phrase that they put to me once, that they accepted they were, quote, islands of autonomy within their country. <laughs> in truth, their authority barely extended to the limits of their capital city. And indeed, not very, uh, there were places even within that where, which were impervious to their instructions. All such examples represent failures of governance and mean that the authorities with whom we, as international human rights bodies and experts engage with, um, were just the wrong people to be able to lever and bring about the change and to achieve what it was that we were setting out to achieve. Perhaps the most intractable problem that I think we ever ran into was of a similar but more elevated nature again. Linking back to the point about our assumptions of the importance of the rule of law, what about those countries where there are simply other <coughs> systems of justice, parallel systems of justice which sit along the official systems, but in many ways very different to them? Sometimes these might be versions of alternative dispute resolution, community-based settlements, in which the national authorities co-opted the assistance of respected figures within the community to work with them or under their delegated authority to address crimes or disputes outside of the parameters, the formal parameters of the criminal justice system. But in others, the informal systems were entirely freestanding of the apparatus of official justice at all. And it might just be a matter of preference or chance which was to be employed in your case. These might include forms of traditional justice, including means of questioning, testing out the veracity of claims, which were little more than trial by ordeal that we have read in our, in, uh, which, which we will be familiar from history, or variants uh, upon this. And similarly, with the nature of, of, of community punishments and so on. It's very easy to be dismissive of all this, and yet it was clear that in some admittedly rare cases, such approaches within countries carried at least as much legitimacy as the official justice systems run by the national authorities, and sometimes even considerably more, particularly in cases where the rule of law was fragile, badly run, administered badly or completely or, or dysfunctional in other ways. I certainly remember being told by one national official you know, you international people, I paraphrase as I quote, 
you international people always come in and tell us wh what we do is wrong, but when the, rule of, when the rule of law, when the government collapsed and there was anarchy in the country, where was it then? Nowhere. These were the systems that allowed us to keep order and it worked. And afterwards, you come back and tell us that we don't know how to run systems? Difficult to answer. I could say that was also from a senior official with responsibility for justice affairs within the country. Stepping back and reflecting, although we are hardly going to agree on this, it wasn't difficult to see where they were coming from on the facts. But the simple point, all the time, as I come to conclude, I am concluding, that I want to just take us back to is this. We assume justice systems, when we look at them, are the justice systems that matter. We assume that the people we talk to about how we fi consider people are treated are the people that matter and are able to exercise influence, because this is how it should be. Sometimes, and more often than I ever expected, this is just not true, and we are deluding ourselves. We are discussing fictions, but we carry on because no one can really afford to accept the truth of this. The result, inevitably, is the entire exercise runs the risk of becoming pointless. So am I saying all our work is pointless? No, I'm not. What I am saying is that when one goes about trying to better prevent torture, when one is trying to get better compliance with human rights standards, when one is trying better to protect the rights of individuals, what is important is to be honest about what it is you see and what you are engaging with. And too much of what I have seen over my years of working in the human rights arena simply projects what it wishes was out there rather than the reality that what is. It is speaking to situations that simply don't exist. We have a tendency to invest states and systems of top-level government with a greater capacity to affect change than is often warranted. These are the rules of our game, and some of those rules turn out to be fictions too. But the final fiction I will finish with is simply this, because it does need mentioning, although I've already alluded to it earlier. Once a state has accepted an international commitment, ratified a treaty, or has voted for the adoption of a set of international standards concerning the outlawry of torture or ill treatment, and there are many, one might reasonably expect them to at least try to achieve what they have undertaken to do. But in so many cases, it is perfectly and painfully obvious that the state does not have the slightest intention of doing anything of the kind and their promises and protestations to the contrary need to be accepted for what they are, <coughs> yet just another fiction. So, preventing torture with the United Nations can indeed be a challenging pastime, but it can be done and progress can be made, but only if we are being a little bit more honest about the realities that we are working with. And so my call in relation to my experience of 10 years of working with the UN to try to uh, improve protection of people from the risk of torture is that it can be done, but you just need to be a little bit more honest with yourselves about what you see, what you find, and how it can practically be responded to, rather than just in the face of what you see, just wishing it were otherwise and acting accordingly. Thank you. an introduction earlier of Nash Saints, an alum of Georgetown College and someone who has had the pleasure of, of knowing Sir Malcolm in the past and working with him, uh, and he's going to be fielding questions for us. So please, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, wait for Mr. Thames to recognize you, and, and then we'll, we'll continue through. Back up. Yeah. I guess, I, uh, since I'm up here and I have the microphone, I'll have the right of the first couple of questions. Just as a baseline, has the United States signed the Convention Against Torture and the Optional Protocol? Yes. 
it has signed the UN Convention Against Torture, which is a very different um, um, type of instrument. It has not signed the optional protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture. And I have to say, ever so quietly within this setting, it was one of the only countries that voted against the adoption of the instrument in the UN General Assembly. <laughs> yeah, it didn't like it. <laughs> we don't usually sign up for things like that. Either. Nah. Yeah. Um, okay, but for this audience, can you tell them why should Americans be concerned about how people are treated in prisons in other countries? Like, what is the relevance for our country? We've got our own issues with our criminal justice system, uh, race relations, police violence. Why should we be mindful of caring about what's happening in other countries? Mm -hmm. Well, the first reason is, of course, from an international law perspective, it is a matter of concern to everyone. Um, under international law, the prohibition on torture is what is legally described. Uh, when, whenever you get oddities, Latin comes into play. We international lawyers describe it as an, obli uh, as, as an obligation of what we call jus cogens, one of the highest obligations of the international community. It is also described, more Latin, as an obligation which is owed erga omnes to absolutely everyone. So as a matter of pure international law, if anyone anywhere is subjected to torture or ill treatment legally, that is of interest um, to everyone, everywhere, including the United States and all other countries. At a, at a slightly more, you, you would say, more, more, more prosaic level, the one thing that we do know um, is that wherever there is situations where people are being tortured or ill-treated, uh, it is because there are largely dysfunctional systems. Um, there, is a, there is a view, and I understand why, why this is the case, and I, I could have talked about that, but I, but I, I chose not to, um, today, is that torture we tend to think as something occurring in quite rarefied situations, um, that it is those moments when you are, to use the expression, torturing a terrorist, to try to find vital information, things that you need to know. Um, that happens. Is the work that we do ever going to stop that? Frankly, no. But is that actually typical of the torture and ill-treatment that takes place around the world? Absolutely not. The vast bulk of torture and ill-treatment takes place on a routine and daily basis as part of the routine operations of state apparatus because it's often just easier or they've got no other means of, of acquiring information and evidence. And you could say, well, does this matter? Yes, because it is indicative then of states and systems of governance which are themselves of the sort that I've been describing ones which are dysfunctional, don't really have a system of control, and are liable then to be precisely those countries which can break down, are fractious, and with whom, basically, you can't do business. And so it's symptomatic of very much else. And where you have these countries where the apparatus of governance are not working in, in the ways that they do, it just breeds more instability, more violence, which affects us all. So it does, at a very practical level, matter to everyone when these practices take place. I would, say, I would add, uh, before my current job, I worked at the State Department in Washington on human rights issues, international religious freedom issues. And we would often talk about, you know, why does the United States promote the rights of other people in other countries? Well, part of it's an expression of our values. We, we don't pretend to be perfect, but we do uh, or take very seriously the importance of defending human rights. And countries that get this right, defending the most vulnerable people in prisons, are going to be better partners for the United States, they'll uphold business treaties, they'll be better like-minded on so many important things. So yes. just a uh, perspective from when I was in government. Mm -hmm. so. And, and it's, it, it's worth adding to that. Uh, the one thing that, again, when I reflect on my experience in so many countries, the one sort of classic area of person that we never really ran into was someone who was rich, well-connected, yes. uh, and so on. The people we are talking about are almost always poor, vulnerable, marginalized, multiple disadvantaged, who are basically being used and instrumentalized by, by, by people because they can exercise power over them. Um, and if you have got people who you know, contacts, if you're relatively wealthy or just have a little, these are not, th this isn't going to happen to you. And again, that says something about creating the, the, the types of societies that we want to live in. Much torture is really about preying on the vulnerable. Great. Let's turn to the audience now. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Um, again, this is going to seem a little bit like a leaf motive. The answer in relation to Russia is none, because Russia did not ratify, like the US, the, the, the convention, although we did not. In fact, within the European theater, there was a similar instrument um, in existence called the European Con Convention for the Prevention of Torture, which prefigured what um, our, our work, and Russia was a party to that system for many years. And so a similar system was operating in relation to Russia, and, the, and, and the, its European counterpart visited Russia very many times. In relation to Ukraine, the short answer is yes, it was a part of this, this system. I myself had visited um, Ukraine about at least three times um, with, with my committee looking at its place, its places of detention, but in the context of at least one of those visits uh, which took place after, um, after the earlier Russian incursions into uh, the Donbass, we did try to cross over into the Donbass area to try to visit those places of detention that were under the de facto control of the, of the um, well, what did the Ukrainians call them? The, um, well, we, I would call them the Russian authorities. They, con they control, describe them as the uncontrolled territories. Yes, yeah. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Yeah. Do you not think that in any sense that torture is still torture after all and it's important to call mm -hmm. human rights, to call for survival, to concern with an international community? Mm -hmm. I think there is a degree of nuance around that. For some countries, the naming and shaming is important because it works for the reasons that you give. For others, it's all you can ever do because there's no other point of contact. But in between the two, there is a very large number of uh, countries who, in my direct experience, that if you stand on a stage and call them out for what, they, for what you know to be taking place, they will simply stand up and say, you've got your facts wrong, you are taking it from you know, bias sources, you don't understand the situation, you're hostile. They will defend themselves. And one sort of gets that because that's what happens in international fora. They need to prove that they're a little bit better than other people so they can criticize others. You, you, you know how it works. I can absolutely assure you that in co private conversation, when they knew it would be limited, I could speak to people from exactly the self-same countries who I knew would be denying what we said in public, who <laughs> would say, and, and some did, that's a fair call. We can have a conversation about what we can do about it. Now, that wasn't universal, but because you were talking, should we say, so often to people less at the, the, forgive me, at the diplomatic level, at the interstate level, but people working at a practical level within country, they recognize the problem. Many of them are not monsters. They don't want these things to happen, and they can actually sort of co-opt you to be on their side in trying to lever and bring about change. And so you can get sometimes much more productive conversation and action going if you are, in some countries, working on a more com confidential level, not because it's confidential, but because you can take some of the opposition and the antagonism or, you know, out of that conversation, because you can build a, a degree of trust. They can see that you know what you're talking about because you've seen it for yourself. What's the point of denying it? Let's see if we can do something a bit better. And they are not threatened by that because they're not being seen to be admitting publicly things that they really are not in a position to accept and admit. There's almost always good people in bad places. So if you can find those good people, then you can maybe make some progress. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Julian. I'm a Washington Post Times editor. Um, I'm curious if you think that the privatization of prisons in countries has really furthered the problems of torture and is rolling back a lot of privatization of prisons could actually help um, lower instances of torture. Mm -hmm. Sure. Th this is, um, again, I have to say, one of those very important questions in which perhaps, how can I put it, sometimes doctrinaire positions come into play because there are those who simply take the view that what are called privatized prisons, which are, as, as you know, prisons which are basically the running of which is outsourced, it's not truly private. They're doing it under very strict contractual terms and, 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 and oversight um, is, is just philosophically wrong. Um, because the state is incarcerating, the state should be taking direct control of those situations. And I get that. At the same time, I can 
the evidence that in countries which have got both, that what goes on in the privately run prisons is always worse than what is taking place in the state-run prisons is, is, is often just not there. And so it is just not possible to say as a universal truth that privately run prisons are always going to be worse than state run prisons. Some are, many are not. And so, but, you know, but there, there are maybe different philosophical questions about what is appropriate, but trying to link that back to the likelihood of ill treatment taking place within them, I don't think is the way of doing it. And when do we need to end? Great. One more question? Three, Three more? Great. More questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Sorry, could, I just didn't hear the last part of your... I said, what is the worst way to torture someone, and how should you think of it? What's the worst way to torture someone, and how they present it? Oh. So maybe no, no recommendations. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I won't go into to, to graphic detail. It's a very difficult question to answer, not least because, you know, in a way you can't really get into, if, if you like, grades of, of, you know, what is ill treatment. I, I spent a long time actually arguing that, you know, part of the problem, you talk about the UN Convention Against Torture, to which the US is a party, part of the problem with that is it defines torture as severe pain and suffering, and so arguments are going, well, it was pain and suffering, it was inhuman and degrading, but it wasn't severe enough to become an act of torture so it doesn't breach our obligations which are not to torture people as opposed to not treat them in an inhuman and degrading fashion. This is a very unedifying debate, um, but it is one that is quite common. And one of the reasons it's unedifying and, and, and helpful is because, frankly, certain things which have a torturous quality when applied to one set of people in one set of circumstances may not necessarily be so in relation to um, to, to others, and so it, it's, it's very difficult to be able to answer that question in, 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 in abs absolute terms, so I'm trying to resist doing it, not because it's not an important or a difficult question, um, but because it doesn't really um, admit of an answer. What I will say, however, is that in my personal view, is that many of the things which we intuitively, many would intuitively think are not that cruel and inhuman or torturous compared to other things really are. And those are particularly things which are not necessarily physical in nature, but which are mental in their nature, and which are put in forms of, of, of what, what we could call either mental torture or psychological pressure on people. These can have very deep and lasting consequences, which many people just fail to recognize the extent of because they still seem to equate torture with forms of physical as opposed to, to, to mental harm. That is, that is done to people. So this would be like solitary confinement? Solitary confinement is an excellent example of that. And certainly we've been in countries, and I've, you know, I've, I've, I've long taken the view that, sh should we say, and something which I know happens here, supermax prisons, for example, the way in which people can be contained and held in supermax prisons, the, the, um, and particularly in the solitary confinement elements of very high security prisons, quite frankly, is one of the most terrible things I think I've seen. Maybe to, to spin off that question though, do you have examples of like successes of where your committee was able to actually mm. yeah. generate reform and see people's conditions mm. improved? Absolutely. Um, we have been to some countries where you can see, you know, at one level, you know, some punishment cells that were being used that were absolutely terrible, not, not you know, slightly different, but along the lines I've just been making that you've insisted have been taken out of use. They have been. Mm. There have been situations in which, um, you know, and, and that at a micro level. There have been situations where we've worked with countries uh, which, as a result of that, have, have, have changed legal and legislative structures to improve access to places of detention, to forbid certain practices, to change the way in which policing operates to make it less likely that they can, that they ill treat people. And also the entire business of setting up national level oversight bodies means that there is a constant presence in those countries of people independently going into detention places where frankly that absolutely just did not happen before. Yeah. And so in some ways I would make, well I would say this wouldn't I, but I could make the case for the practical outcome of 
this particular convention being probably the most impactful of mm -hmm. any that the United Nations has put in place. There are literally 70 or 80 of these national mechanisms now operating in very many <laughs> countries around the world, and in many of them before, no one ever had the power to go into these places of detention routinely and to be able to raise the case of individuals that they find there. On any day now, hundreds of such visits will be taking place, engaging with thousands of detainees mm -hmm. around the world, and I think that matters. Yeah. Just a quick editorial, I will say, I think as an American, we hear a lot of negativity about the United Nations, mm. but you know, as someone who's worked with these institutions, it was a, an institution generally that the United States played a key role in founding, mm. we've been a part of many of these treaties, and there are effective ways to see our values, our priorities, to see the world a better, more peaceful place, mm. carried forward without us having to do it. So the United mm. Nations is such an important player in these spaces, mm. in these dark corners mm. that are often forgotten and overlooked. Yeah. I, I would endorse that, um, absolutely. You know, the power of good that can be done through these mechanisms and through the bodies and very many others working there is enormous. Yeah. Um, there are challenges out there. There are quite a lot of powers and states who are simply trying to blunt the utility of these and to downplay and, de and degrade them. And those who believe in the values that we believe in have got a duty, I think, to try to uphold and support that. And the United Nations is the vehicle, is the prime vehicle through which that can be done. It reaches places that simply cannot be reached in, in, in other ways. Yeah. And it's easy to knock bodies because everybody has ev everything has got a problem associated with it. But it's so important to see the power of what's been put yeah. in place and try to harness that for the reasons that you give. I don't know if British Baptists say amen after a good point, but we'll just say amen to that. So any other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the very back. We would not do that as our body itself, but it is um, a very important thing that, 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 that should be being done in order to try to um, you know, improve the knowledge base about the way in which you know, people are, are, are treated in detention. And I can tell you that it is something that most, uh, that most governments would routinely offer um, to people under those circumstances. They would not wish to demand it, of course, um, but many would wish to do it, and it is a facility that would normally exist because it is information that one really needs to know. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, it, first of all, it goes into the entire business of this difficult question of, of, of parallel systems um, of, of, of governance. The international community, should we say, speaks with a little bit of a forked tongue on this. On the one hand, it decries such things, but particularly when it's looking at traditional justice systems in the context of um, indigenous groups, for example, and, pre and preserving the rights of indigenous communities, um, often traditional practices relating to dispute resolution and indeed punishment form part of that matrix. And there's never really been a terribly satisfactory unpicking of how those two things um, interact. But the top line issue coming out of your question is, you know, what is the purpose of a criminal justice system? What is the purpose of, you know, altogether in the face of an infraction? Is it really a matter of punishment? Um, you know, is that what is really going on? There will often be, a, obviously, a punitive element, but is that the driving force in how you respond to a wrong that has been committed you know, with, within, within the community. And so much of the, the disproportionality of what takes place is often because probably of an over-focus on the punitive element of a response rather than looking beyond that in order to see, well, you know, what are the causes you know, of, 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 of what is going wrong, what is appropriate in order to you know, address the criminality that we see. One of the, one of the terribly sad facts 
um, if you look at the prison populations around the world, you know, who were most of the people in prisons? Most of them, people in prisons, tend to be people between the ages of about 18 and about 25. And the one thing that you can be fairly clear about is that being in prison, people at that age, they are not going to come out of prison any better. It will not have been a positive experience for them. The other thing that you can probably say is that very many of those people, whatever it is that they have done, and I'm not blind to the terrible things that some people do, believe me, um, but many of them have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time, being misled, misunderstanding, doing things which in a couple of years' time they would never do again. But the experience of prison is something that it makes it more likely that they will end up repeating those behaviours, having those life chances taken away from them at what is a critical time of their, of, their, of their development as people. And so we do run the risk in society of making our problems so much worse by putting, you know, by treating you know, the people who are still often quite vulnerable and marginal people who are suffering very many problems themselves. In the UK, well, over a third, I think, more than a th about two thirds estimate gives of all um, um, prison population issues relate back in some ways to drugs-related offences, either because they're dealers, because they have been committing crimes because of drugs, etc., etc., and, 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 and so on. Is that the way to solve that problem? Probably not. The idea of punishment versus rehabilitation. Yep. So one last question. Who wants to have the last question? Yes, ma'am. What is the common um, recommendation that is made to the countries you, uh, that you visited after the, um, well, let me rephrase, what is that? Let me rephrase. Yeah. What is the common yeah. recommendation that was made to the countries in the confidential, like, report yeah. after you visited? Yeah. Well, it almost goes without saying I'm not going to be able to say what was in the confidential reports because <laughs> they still remain confidential. But the point that you make is absolutely heart, that goes to the heart of really what I was saying and the frustration I felt with so much of what went on within the UN for reasons I fully understand. It's this temptation to resort to traditional agreed language. This is something that we've said before. No one objects if we say it. Um, so if we say that again, we won't have any problems, but we can say that we've said it. You know, the tyranny of agreed language. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a nightmare, particularly when the sort of situations you're addressing are, as I've described, they are very focused, very variable, um, relating to the situation. The one I loathed was when you would simply say some bodies, or occasionally, I'm afraid, even I found that we'd even done it too, you, know, you recommend that people comply with all their human rights obligations. Well, for goodness sake, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? You know, the test I always gave to my members is, look, if someone gave you that recommendation, what would, would you know what to do? And if you don't know what to do as a result of receiving a recommendation, then don't be surprised if no one does what you want them to do, because it's simply not clear. But more, more granularly, you know, I wouldn't say there was a common recommendation for that very reason. I discouraged them. I said, look, look to see what the situation is and see what actually would make a difference. And I can give you perhaps one final example of, and, and I do think this is an example of a more helpful um, approach, though bizarre though it seems. Our committee, when I was chair, refused to set out new statements of standards. There are millions of standards. We've got plenty of standards. It's application that counts. One of those standards is that anyone who is being held in a, um, in, in, in a prison, for example, must at least have some opportunity of outside exercise every day. You say, okay, nice, but it's, it's worse than that. The consequences of not will lead to blindness, skin disease. If people are permanently incarcerated in, in, in dark rooms, in overcrowded, the, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot more serious than not having out of cell a bit of exercise. We were in one country, and I did go into a cell. I won't go into the details of how terrible it was, but believe me, it was truly terrible. Um, the people in there were in a terrible state. No one had been let out for about three or four months. It was absolutely unspeakable inside, and they were desperate. And so we said to God, why on earth will you not let them go outside the cell? Until you looked at it, it was a bit of a dysfunctional country. Um, if you imagine, this would be the prison. You had a perimeter wall here. You had a number of these huts holding cells inside, surrounded just by the perimeter wall. The only place people could exercise if they were let out was between the buildings, between the buildings and the wall. There were four guards exercising authority over the entire place. And there was only one slight problem. And they fully accepted it. 
it was a bit of a difficult country. The gate was here at the front to the prison, which is very remote, except that it had dropped off. Yeah. So if they let anyone out of the cell blocks, there was nothing to stop everyone just disappearing. It was the only time when the sensible preventive recommendation that we were able to make basically come down to get new gates on the front of the prison. You won't find that in any of the statements of international standards, but it was the only beginning of trying to improve the situation for the people concerned. And to try to pretend anything else that you say was going to make any difference was nonsense. Well, I want to just thank you for your service to really the least of these, these people who are in locked away in forgotten prisons, um, sort of uh, no longer wear a government hat, but uh, just as a, a Christian, someone who believes in the, um, the inherent dignity of the individual, that you know, God placed value on every person, that ensuring that they're treated with dignity in prison cells is, I think, part of the Christian mission, it's part of the Christian ethos. So thank you as a Christian, thank you as a former government official, thank you for what you did, and um, <coughs> I'm going to turn the podium back over to our host. Great. Thank you. free to go.